freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Welcome to episode number 423 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearmsauctions.com, where you set the price on guns, ammo, and accessories. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is Defenders USA, and our guest is Adam Winch. Adam is a founder and owner of Defenders USA and also the owner of Crossroads Precision Markmanship Academy. Defenders is an armed and unarmed defense training company and Crossroads Crosswinds Precision Markmanship Academy (laughs) is a long-range sniper and training company. Adam and his highly skilled team have trained tens of thousands of people ranging from civilians, military, and law enforcement personnel in order to offer good and moral citizens the opportunity to develop the same training and mental emotional heart sets that he developed during his service as a law enforcement officer welcome finally to the show adam (laughs) winch thank you for having me we've been trying to do this for a year so thank you so much Absolutely. I was looking back on my notes and I had originally written a major guest page in October oh, no. of 22. And we're <laughs> sitting here today in July 11th of 2023. But perseverance pays off. And I am so excited to have you on and talk about all of this because it doesn't matter who you talk to. If, if they're a serious and responsibly armed person, citizen, the key is always training, 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 training. That's the key to safety. And that's why I got tongue-tied, because I want to know about this long-range sniper training right? for civilians. Oh, we'll talk about it. We'll talk okay. about it. Well, that's why I was getting confused. I, I want to do that. Right? <laughs> Me too. Well, now we know a guy, right? Yeah. So, Adam, what caused you to start a defensive training company, and you've titled it that very specifically rather than a firearms training company. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you noticed that not, not too many people notice. Right. So, okay. So first of all, what caused it? I I tell you, that's kind of a long answer and a little bit multifaceted in a sense. Um, So I grew up in West Africa um, as a missionary kid. So we went over there. In fact, we left the States, I think when I was five or six and didn't really come back full time till I was 18 or just turning 18. So in that time frame, right, I lived in countries where extreme corruption, right, mm-hmm. violence was kind of the, the commonality of the day. Despite we saying that a, a violence and crime in America is awful and terrible, it's far worse overseas, right? We still live in, I would tell you, one of the safest nations in the country, depending on where you live, unless you're right in the city somewhere, right? Um, so for the most part, I lived in uh, areas that weren't as safe. And because I kept seeing victims of crime, and I guess as a missionary's kid where you're just there to help people, you know, I I wasn't the pastor, the preacher. You just sit there and you see that violence and think, man, someday I'd love to be able to, these people will learn to defend themselves the way we would in America, which you couldn't do there because they don't have the rights or freedoms we do here in the U.S. And hence, if you see Defenders USA back there, part of the thing is I want Americans to be able to defend themselves, right? Then later... Uh, once I was back, I immediately ran off to like a military college and then later was in, in the army. And in the army, I joined as an MP or a military police officer thinking, OK, one, it's the road to becoming a civilian cop. And two, I always wanted to be in the military. And three, I can learn the stuff it's needed for the everyday civilian to be able to defend themselves. Later, a police officer in Colorado for over a decade you know, SWAT team, street crimes, patrol, you name it. And in that process too, I constantly saw the victims of crime, right? As a cop, all I did 
will show up on your worst day. And, you know, it, it, you see the rapes, the, the, the assaults, the murders, the, the, just the, the debauchery and the hatred and the human, uh, of humanity, right? The bloodshed of humanity on a daily basis, day in, day out. And, and it just sat there and it just kept tugging at my heart that, boy, somebody's got to train these people. At the time, we didn't have very much training in the area in Colorado that I was in that was worth anything at all. And so I kept kind of griping about it and talking, hey, we got we should do something to train these people. If we train them, we don't have to show up. They don't have to get, you know, become raped or shot or killed or whatever. You know, they can defend themselves. And at some point, another cop just kind of looked at me and said, hey, if you're going to gripe about it, why don't you do something about it? <laughs> and, and I mean, that's what I was kind of thinking anyways, but it solidified or crystallized the mission. And right then and there, I went ahead and started on the side with everything else going on training civilians and it i don't know i just started this kind of what we call the military hip pocket training i just pulled it out of my hip pocket and started doing stuff i didn't have a program i just said hey this is what people need because this is what i see on the street so let's train them what i think they need and uh it grew a name and it exploded i didn't think it was going to do that it just did and it got to where literally i was so busy i couldn't do all the cop stuff and the training stuff and well I've been doing copping for a decade and I thought, you know what? I've always wanted to own a business in America. Let's see how it goes. And well, that's been 10 years. And you know, if it ever fails, I go back to cop work. Awesome. That, that is incredible because you know, it, it really is that what difference can one person make? You are one person and you decided to make the difference. It's that old adage of somebody ought to do something. And then the next mirror you pass, you're like, oh, Fred, I guess that's, <laughs> well, I guess I'm somebody. If you look at it, that we are our the first responder. Exactly. Yes. And so if we know that, okay, so I wake up in the morning and say, I know that I'm the first responder. So for what? And how am I going to get trained for it? How, how am I going to know how to handle that? And you said hip pocket. And I'm thinking, you know, just real world. Like you're like, this is what I see, this horrible stuff. What could have prevented that? Let's train for that gap, right? And uh, it's not always firearms. So I love that you are Defenders USA and that it's defensive training. Yes. So let's talk about the actual training. Like what does Defenders USA offer? Oh, wow. So we do everything, right? In fact, uh, we have one of our trainers right now, as we're speaking, he's doing a corporate non-gun training course in Colorado, right? He's training a bunch of hospital staff right now, how to recognize guns that might come into their hospital, how to take and, you know, if they have to take that from somebody who's been hurt because it's still on their belt, which I mean, that happens, right? Um, they got to take it from them, clear it, how to, how to recognize that, how to do that safely. Right. So we're doing some corporate training literally as we speak right now. Um, so we do a lot of corporate training. Um, I just got done teaching uh, a, a, a real estate agent safety course, strategies, strategies for safety for real estate agents. If you don't know that world, I mean, it's one of the most dangerous professions in America. I mean, it, you could be you could be the cashier at the local stop and rob, and that's just as dangerous as for a taxi driver as it is being a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of violence in that industry. So I just got done teaching one of those. Um, we teach like bank anti robbery, anti hostage courses. I just got doing got done doing one of those last month. Um, we do church security, you know, different situational awareness, crisis and verbal de escalations. You name it. We do a lot of different things there. But more of the bread and butter of what we do is really the guns, right? Because most people are more interested in the gun side of this. Um, so from the gun aspect, right, we start with basic gun things, whether it's concealed carry or just basic handgun, working it to where literally in the handgun world, training SWAT teams, police departments, special operations, literally from grandma good cookies to the warrior, right, is what we do. And it's from beginning to end. Um, I just got done running a police instructor course uh, just a couple weeks ago and trained a whole bunch of detectives and cops. Um, yet, just a couple days ago, I was teaching literally Grandma Good Cookies, right, who had never touched a gun in her life. Um, so we do that. Oh, yeah. We also run a lot of fighting yeah. rifle courses. Think like AR-15s, AK-47s for those who still use those things or want to use those things. Uh, and then, of course, we have, as Dan mentioned, long-range precision. Um, 
So Dan, what we're doing since this last year when Cheryl and I first set this up is I'm actually phasing out Crosswind Precision. That's a company that I helped start and then I ultimately bought out and then I'm slowly phasing it out. We're putting all the long range precision under defenders. And so when it comes to long range precision, we start from literally very beginning for people who have never touched the gun in their life to literally sniper craft. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of steps to get there uh, to where we're now getting tactical teams, uh, literally special operations who come to us and they get extremely in-depth training. Uh, that's I, I can't tell you how I'm trying to nutshell, which is very expansive into something small. But uh, if it's defensive in nature, we do it. Um, so there you go. If that answers the question. Awesome. I, you know, I shot I, I shot all my life, but one time I was at the shot show and I shot a mile away and I hit the target and it was real windy first shot. And that was because the, the spotter helped me really yes. well. But that was so exciting. But anyway, I want to get back to the hospital uh, training for the hospital. And, and something that didn't occur to me that a lot of people that are working in the hospital, they don't want guns. No, but they have to be, allowed. they may be, appro well, they may not like guns though. And they, they may be approached by a gun. And I never thought about the process of if somebody gets wounded that has a gun and you take the gun away from them, how do you handle that gun if you don't like guns? And that's excellent because then it keeps somebody else from getting hurt by knowing how to handle the gun and clear it. Right. Let's say some ER uh, tech, some nurse, some doc tries to go and, you know, they have to just robe them. They find that concealed gun on them that maybe wasn't found at the accident scene or wherever it is, right? I had that happen multiple times as a cop. And now the gun shows up and somebody who doesn't know what they're doing grabs that gun and maybe they grab the trigger or something. Now you put a bullet into people or things in a hospital and bullets in hospital rooms usually don't go well. So, or, or let's say this patient who's been brought in by the ER or the ambulance, right? Because of head trauma, they might start doing things they don't realize they're doing. It's the same reason why as soon as a cop or a soldier or somebody's hurt badly, if they're armed, you immediately disarm them because they might do things they don't even realize they're doing. And uh, so therefore, these folks need to know how to clear those things, secure those things, handle those things in a safe manner just because. Um, so it's I was grateful to see every time we have some some hospital, some medical facility willing to, to do that training which steps outside their normal bailwick, right? As Cheryl mentioned, right? They're usually either not allowed, it's politically frowned upon in those areas, which is unfortunate, sad, because it is a way of life in America. Mm -hmm. And therefore these people to get the training. So when I can find the hospital systems or the medical systems that are willing to do this, you know, they're being at least proactive and thinking of their own people versus their politics. Right. It's, to me, it's like teaching a kid to swim if you don't have a pool. Yeah. You know, because they might go to the next door neighbor has a pool. Well, same thing. If a person that doesn't like guns sees a gun and that gun could be a danger to someone, uh, at least know how to approach that gun, how to clear it and, and dispose or, you know, handle it. So I, I think that's awesome. And you don't, you don't think that deep sometimes. Well, there's so many, I think there are more places where we can't or don't take firearms than where we can and do. And so to have all of the rest of that, the mindset, the training, the knowledge uh, is really kind of a, it's a no brainer, but I think the, the other side of a no brainer is we're not thinking about it. We don't realize how much we need that training. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it, to me, it comes down to this, right? You really want to build, as you just said, the mindset, really, I'd call it the heart set, right? If you can build the defender's heart set. Um, which to me, really, the gun is simply the exclamation at the end of that sentence or the end of that word, right? The gun is simply just a tiny tool. Whatever defensive you're, tooling, you're using is just a tiny tool to the entire mentality. And if you can build that entire mentality, that entire emotional mindset, you name it, in others, even if maybe they don't appreciate guns, don't like guns, now we can help people be more efficient with what they do, certainly be more safe. And is that not what we want? That's the point of guns in the first place mm -hmm. is to be safe. So if we can build that mindset, let alone get those skills into people, whether they like them or not, now you might either cause less havoc or save more life by building that in other people. Sure. 
Absolutely. It's awesome. And um, Grandma Good Cookies is, I think, my my new favorite. <laughs> That's what Kimberly's going to start calling you that. I, I love to, to Dan, you better watch out. <laughs> I know. Seriously. I love that. Um, okay. So above and beyond the training, right? And we were talking a little bit about heart set, mindset. The heart set thing, I think, is key here. But what is one of the main overarching themes that you emphasize through Defenders USA? You know, I, I'd say there's many. Um, one of the biggest overarching themes is really that to steal this from others, and I don't know who to attribute this to, but you are your own defender, right? You have no time to wait for somebody else. You know, I, I cop for over a decade. My hot little wife is a cop. We are never there when it happens, right? We are there to clean up the pieces, to maybe provide some comfort, certainly to help you in the prosecution of when evil visits. We're never there when evil visits, right? Evil knows that a guy or girl with a badge and a gun is 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 bad for them, is detrimental for them, for their plan. So they wait till we're, we're not there, obviously, and they do their evilness. So we can't be there. You know, I, I've only been there when the crime happened maybe five or six times ever in my career. And I'm talking a violent crime, not your basic traffic stuff. But when a violent crime was planned and Mr. Bad Guy was just dumb enough to not realize there was a cop standing right there. Right. So that's a rarity. So therefore, you have to be your own defender. Yet to me, I think too often in the gun world, the gun training world, we focus so much on the gun that or we focus too much volume upon the gun to where we don't give more to the person, right? So if we can, and we've kind of talked about this, if we can build the true mental, emotional, spiritual, um, and I tell you, psychological mindsets of, of, of being willing to fight through, to accept the pain if they have to, to, to be sure that they go home to their family, to, to also be willing to be vicious if need to be, right? And, and extremely vicious if need be. Uh, to 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 know their laws well, to know that they're they're within the right of what they do, which means they got to know it on a conceptual level. If we can build all this on a conceptual level to other people, they can act and react more efficiently, certainly more effectively. And to me, that becomes the entirety of what we're doing, and it makes the emphasis building defenders versus building shooters. You know, I, I find be a shooter. We can build skill in a monkey. Right. Anybody can. But building the mindset is is the hard part. Right. And and it, to me, building the heart set, the mindset is the most important. Then we add the skill of the gun, the knife, pepper spray, the situational awareness, everything else. So to me, the overarching thing is is really you're your own defender. You're the cop, your daddy, your mommy, your brother, your sister can't be there to help you. You have to do it yourself. And if you're not willing to do it yourself or don't know how to do it yourself, then you need to build that within you and go find it from experts who can help you build this in a way that's efficient. So you're not batting around, you know, constantly reading all the books or watching YouTube or trying to do it on your own and learning all the bad things versus the more efficient, good things. So if I can build a defender, um, especially on the conceptual level, the rest will follow. You know, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but... The, the reason right, I think, I can bleep it out. well, yeah, I guess you can, but the, you know, when you first start carrying a gun, a person starts carrying a gun. And this is why responsible gun owners need to seek training because yes. you care, you, you, you carry a gun, you first start carrying a gun. All you th you're focused on is that gun. Whereas if you focus on your surroundings and what's happening around you and other ways to defend yourself, you may never have to draw that gun. Mm. Whereas, so, if, you know, most people would that are new in it would just grab the gun and start shooting. And that's not necessarily the right thing to do. What do you say? So about that? You, you touch on a very interesting point and that those who train more tend not to become the victims of crime in the first place. Right. Because right. that training makes you realize how fragile life is, yet also how tough life is. Right. But how fragile it is. And it opens you up to better I hate the word because the community uses it too much, but better situational awareness, right? To use use it easily. Um, but it, it makes you more aware of what's going on around you in the 360 degree environment. It makes you more, I wouldn't say suspicious, um, but it makes you more cognitive of what other people are doing and thinking that could be detrimental to you or those you love. 
And because you start seeing more of the world just through basic training, just basic training of different things makes you more aware out there of what's going on out there. You tend to wake up more to your own personal safety and the safety of others. And you tend not to become the victim of crime. It's so interesting that, you know, I, I would arrest thousands upon thousands of people. And I was always curious. So I'd talk to my dirt bags that I'd hook, you know, arrest. Um, I'd talk to these people as I'd put them in jail and be like, okay, why'd you pick grandma over here? Why'd you pick up that, that dude? Why did you pick on that kid? What, what was the reason? And almost invariably the recidivist, right? The professional bad guy, the one that's been to criminal you, right? Prison. Um, those people will tell you that they can see those who have more awareness of what's going on around them. And because those people tend not to be a good victim of crime for them, they tend to go look for the ones that pay no attention to their surroundings. And that's the people that don't have training, right? You know, right. untrained right. people save their lives every day in America. God bless America. Even dumb people can own guns, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the trained person opens up their mentality and their heart to their surroundings. They tend not to become the victim of crime because they look less like food to a bad guy because Mr. Right. Mr. Bad guy realizes that right. person's a little bit switched on. I could get hurt. You know, they could attract attention. I could get caught. So I'm going to go pick on these people over here who are lost in the sauce in their cell phone somewhere or something because they're a far better victim of crime. So you touch on something really good. The more you get training, um, the more aware you tend to become. Therefore, you're less likely to, likely to have to pull your pepper spray, pull your knife, pull your gun. The more, the more likely you are to never even see violence or have to live through the emotional impact of violence simply because you trained yourself. Yeah, I've seen, yeah. I've actually seen that happen where, you know, you come out of a grocery store and you're kind of, you know, just in a zone, but then you see somebody in the corner and you, you perk up and you just kind of, you yeah. not like you're running scared, but you act like, I know where I'm at. I know what you're doing. And they walk away Yeah, where you know that there were, if you would have just played dumb a little longer, you would have been approached by him. And it's not a false bravado, right? It's not a false confidence because bad people, right? Evil people are really good at reading others, right? That's their job. Just like a cop, their, their job is read somebody to see, are they a good victim or not? You know, that's their entire job. So, so they can tell the false bravado, right? I, I see these courses where like a real estate, you know, <laughs> teaching one recently and they were like, well, our last person said, just act confident, even if you're not. Okay, I get that, but you know what? Confidence is really born out of confidence. And if you get build confidence in people, that gives them confidence. And that confidence is genuine. And Mr. Dirtbag, who's looking for a victim, can see that true internal confidence within somebody, realize they're confident because they're confident. And they go, never mind, I'm going to go pick on somebody else over there because they don't have it. They're not even switched on enough. And even if they fake it, they can tell it. Because just like dogs can sniff out fear, bad guys can tell when somebody's faking it. Right. So confidence comes from competence. Right? Yes. Yes. And um, I I want to talk now about this book I'm seeing leaned up behind you because <laughs> we were chatting off air yeah. and I think that that this is like a great segue for that. I was hoping we were going to have time to lean into we're, that and I'm just going to make time. I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Adam in a minute. But, um, you know, fake it till you make it. I, no. I think there's a place for that, but not where you are talking, right? Not as a defender no. of your own life and the lives of others. It's got to be deep within you that you know what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and gonna do it if you have to. And predators, as you said, they have a nose exactly for that because that's the key to their their success, their survival and their um, pocketbook usually, right? How they're gonna go about uh, spending your money if they're there to rob you. So lean into that, tie it into you know our, the books behind you because I'm a book nerd and I want our audience to know what you read. Someone that is as excellent as you are, what is it that you're reading to build your levels of excellence? Oh, well, I think because you said you're a book nerd, you and I can be friends now, right? <laughs> I love to other. read. How are you going to have time to be friends if you're both reading books all the time? <laughs> love to read. All right. yeah. Okay, so I, I think you're right. Not, not I think you're right. You are right, right? Mr. Bad Guy is is a wily person, right? They're very intuitive. They're, they're, they're cunning. Um, and though they may not be smart, because they're usually kind of dumb, they're cunning. And so therefore to them, 
when somebody has honed their mental edge, that usually means they've often honed their physical edge too. And Mr. Bad Guy being wily or at least cunning of some type, instinctual in that nature, knows that. So you you brought up this book right here, right? Uh, been reading this one a couple different times. I'd recommend it to you. It's called The Inner Game of Tennis. And it's written by a guy named Timothy Galloway. Um, phenomenal. It's a, it's a performance book. Um, yeah, it's about tennis, but it can be applied to anything, right? And understand it, it's just like anything else. The principles are what applies, right? So if you don't like tennis, if tennis makes you mad, big deal, right? Go bash your your racket like Andre Agassi and 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 learn from that book, right? Um, uh, it, it just talks about focusing on the process of doing things instead of focusing on the outcome, right? In the shooting world, too often we focus on the outcome and we we forget the process and of course, bad things happen there. Where I've come to find for me that when I, when I become process focused, the outcome always takes care of itself. And we could talk, you know, your bullet hitting the target. We could talk, you know, dribbling a basketball, if that's your thing. It, it could be running a radio show, right? Or running a, an internet show, right? When you focus on the process and work that through present, you know, staying present moment, mo- you know, moment by moment, you tend to do a lot better when you're worried about what other people think or do, what, what you should be doing next, what just happened back there that was bad. And so when you process focus, you get better. So that's what that one of that, one of those books is about. Another book I'm reading right now currently is called The Confidence Gap. Um, I would like to think that most people have some type of confidence gap. I mean, at least I do on occasion, right? You guys look like very confident people and I want to grow up to be you. But in the meantime, I'm reading this to get there, right? Um, to help with that. And this is this is really just constantly talking about, you know, um, the commitment to things. We were talking earlier about how competence brings confidence, right? Well, to bring to build that confidence, you have to commit to doing what you're doing to become so good at it, you can be confident in it, right? It's not fake it till you make it, certainly not in the defensive world where you're relying on that gun, or really better your instincts to save or preserve your life, more importantly, somebody else's. So if it comes down to defensive mindsets or defensive skills of any type, right? We don't have that naturally. So we have to build that. So most people go into it or they avoid training because they don't feel confident. They want to, they want to feel like they're confident before they go, where I tell you, go fail, go fail over and over, go to training, be willing to fail. And then over time, as you think about it, you focus on the process, you learn the nuance of it because mastery is always in the nuance. And as you work on that nuance and build it within yourself thoughtfully, then you will start to be become good at what you do. And when you become good at it and you realize if you're honest with yourself about you're good at it, you can build that confidence that now gives confidence and it shows to Mr. Bad Guy on an intuitive level that they don't even need words to sense. You know what? I, I, we need to move to Colorado because he's my new best friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dan, I live that. here in Arizona now. I live here. Oh, oh, you do? Okay. He yeah, we moved here. Colorado. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, we definitely need to. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, it's amazing yeah, what you're saying. Amazing. I mean, I look at when I read a script, I'm thinking about the end of the script instead of what I'm reading, and I fumble words. Is that why you looked at me and kind of grinned yeah. at yourself? Yeah, because <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you look at the end results instead of looking at the steps to follow to get it through. Yeah, it's, so so this is something I, I, I always struggled with, right? I, I was usually pretty good at whatever I did, but I wasn't excellent. I wasn't great. And I've always wanted, you know, excellence is a passion for me, right? I've always wanted to be the one who could do things excellently. And, and I started focusing on this. Okay, how do I become so? And I realized in there through all the reading, the research, there's so many more books, Cheryl, like we could talk about here that it would help, right? But I, I started realizing as I went to other trainers who were truly world-class, or I, I started reading people that are renowned experts, and I started realizing that it was really oftentimes, Dan, for me, it was a selfish or a self-centered focus. And I don't mean it in a bad way. I just mean it. it's it's a self-focus that I want to be sure I do right here, that I'm thinking about how I might sound or how I might be coming across to others, uh, or, or I'm worried about what's going to come next or what I just did that wasn't exactly perfect, and I wasn't present in that moment. And, and by doing that, I would either fumble the before or the after, or the before or the after, and it just seemed like I could never, you know, I could never get it exactly right. But when I started focusing on the moment by moment, the process of these, the tiny minutia of the process, and I let the the future, even three seconds from now, 
and the past, even three seconds behind, just go and stay in that mental presence then it helped. The other one was I also realized, and I, when I say selfish or a, a self view, is is for me at least. I realized that that uh, well, I just lost my train of thought. I realized that that I was less, I was slightly less interested in the message than I was in myself, and the message. Or we could say the student, or we in this case, we could say your listeners. Your listeners are far more important than I am, right? You two people are way more important than I am. They're the only important thing out there. And if I stop taking a little bit of that focus or attention off myself and focused on what do I got to do to give this message that's utterly important to these people, if I do that and focus on that, I forget myself. And when I forget myself and realize they're the most important thing out there, this message is the most important thing out there. And I've got to get it in their brain, in the way with which they think, in the way with which their mind sees pictures, in the way with which their heart understands. And it's not how I think of it. It's how they how they take it. And do they take it in the way that it's intended to be? And when I started focusing on the student and made them the true utmost priority, I lost myself and I started staying more present in the moment and the messages got more clear. The skill grew in our classes and I could see the mental, emotional growth, physical growth, right? Skill growth in people far faster when I, than when I always had kind of a somewhat focus on myself and the message and others. And I just realized wow. they're the most important thing in the world. I'm the least important thing in the world. At the same time, conversely, my knowledge of this or ability to convey this skill or these messages is also most important. So oddly, you're the most important person in the message, but they are the most important person. Really, it's just you're the one who's the conveyor of it. And I know that sounds weird and all Zen-like, but I hope that makes sense. No, I just saw a lot of that because you're right. You know, you're right. It's just, so I, wow. I agree. And I, um, the way I've experienced it over sort of the arc in my life, is I used to be very perfectionistic. And I think that trying to be a perfectionist is a very self-focused. Yes, yes, thing. yes. Right? And so once I I worked through that and, and decided, you know what, if I fumble a word here or there, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> Nobody notices nearly as much as I do. And, and they know what you're saying. Exactly. And so once I moved past that perfectionist mindset, um, somehow excellence followed. Yeah. And I have to say that um, it's not like I walk around even feeling like I'm excellent at anything. It's just, it's not part of my top of mind, but it must come through because uh, one of the events that I uh, am in charge of helping bring speakers to is is the Second Amendment rally yes. that we have Incredible uh, in rally. Arizona. Thank you. And we hold it on the Arizona State Capitol lawn. And we I try to bring awesome speakers to help inspire people. And afterwards, you gave me such a, a, a beautiful compliment, um, boost of confidence that you said you felt like, you know, I had such a level of excellence. You wanted to unpack that. You wanted to talk about that with me. And you've given me the gift of inviting me on your podcast yes. to talk about that. And so it got me thinking in that terms of like, oh, that is interesting because I have moved to a different way of behaving and lovely. Thank you so much for recognizing mm -hmm. it and, and showing me and telling me, uh, oh, I must really have moved down the road <laughs> from well, where it, I used to be. Yeah. It, it, I mean, that rally, it's just, it ran so smooth. It was just so clean. It was crisp, which may sound weird to describe as a rally. It was just, it moved along so well that you could tell somebody truly put their heart and soul into it. And they thought about not just the rally and the planning of it, but they had organized themselves, their mentality, their heart. At least that's what it seems from the outside. And, and to me, you know, excellence goes across the board. If you're excellent in certain areas, you're probably also going to apply that same type of principle in other areas. And, and, and therefore, that's somebody that I want to align with, or if not align with, I want to learn from, right? Because it's a constant pursuit, and I'm not there yet. 
And so if I can learn from you guys, I want to learn from you guys. So, um, hey, can I go back to something? Yeah. So I had a realization, at least for me, and this may not work for other people, but I was always so outcome focused that I finally kind of came up with a phrase that I say over and over in my classes. And it's not so much for the students. It's really for me, but I hope they get it too. That if you focus on the process and forget about the outcomes, the outcome will take care of itself. And I've learned that in my shooting and, and I'd like to think in my relationships and everything else. If I just focus on the process, I'm present in it moment, moment by moment, sensing every bit of it, seeing, smelling, feeling every bit of it, and just focus on that moment, uh, the outcome takes care of itself. I had a kind of a catharsis moment. I, it's very simplistic, but a couple a couple months ago, I was taking another course with Rob Latham, if you know what it is, right? World's greatest shooters ever walked the face of the earth. And, and I was struggling because, you know, I was probably the top shooter in his class or close to, and I was struggling with one little thing. I was trying to beat Rob Latham, right? And I just, yeah, just right there, and I just couldn't do it. And, and he finally stood there and he's watching me. He's kind of laughing at me because, you know, he knows I'm not going to beat him. And, um, and, and he's like, he's like, Adam, you know how he, he talks. He's like, Adam, just stop. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, dude. Just do the thing until the thing is done. Then go do the other thing. And what he was saying was, I was getting almost done with what I'm doing. Yes, it's just shooting, but the principle applies to anything. I was almost done. Then I'd move on to something else without really staying present at the last nth of that thing. And he repeated that a couple of times. Just do the thing until the thing is done. And then do the other thing and stay there until it's done. And I was like, oh, process focus. Focus on the process. The outcome will take care of itself. I love that. Um, so I want to touch back on um, the idea, just so we start wrapping up a little bit, but the idea that you are your own first responder, that you know, help may or may not come. Uh, and if it comes, it's going to come in the form of maybe helping clean up the mess that has yep. happened through violence. And um, I just wonder, the people that come to you for training, how many are really sort of forward thinking and realizing, well, this is a tool I should just have in my toolbox. And how many came to that realization through the unfortunate circumstance that life taught them some really ugly and hard lessons. Um, and they've been the victim or the survivor of something horrible. So this is a really good question, right? Um, I'd tell you probably 25, 30% come because, especially if it's a gun class, because it's sexy, it's cool, it goes bang, right? Um, which, fine, I don't care how you come, doesn't matter to me as long as you come, right? I'd say probably another third or so come because they're forward thinking, hey, you know, we just, and I just had this a couple of days or a couple of weeks ago, um, hey, we just had a baby and I realized suddenly I got to defend this baby and my wife, right? Or, hey, um, my husband just left me and you know what? I just realized I'm all by myself in the world and I've got to defend myself, right? I, I, this darling grandma, right? You know, in her late seventies and she's going, he just passed away. I can barely hold this gun, but I've got to build strength because I live in a little box by myself and who's better than the victim of crime than, than grandma in her sealed box. Right. And, and she's like, I got to learn to defend myself. Right. So you have the forward thinkers. Here's the unfortunate part and the heart to your question, Cheryl. I'd tell you at least 20 something percent, if not 30 percent of the people that come to me. And this is what I hate is they come to me because they, they, they've been the victim of crime. Right. And it's always interesting when I have the two or three day class when or, or maybe a one day class where Though they might not say it, I can see them relive the rape. You can see it. You can see it, right? I, I see them relive the assault, uh, the murder, right? Um, the the kidnap, or just the traumatic event they went. And usually, usually in every class, I'll get one or two people that come forward. And, you know, they want they want to step off to the side. So you do. Usually, it's a lunch break or something. We step off to the side, or right after the class when their heart's just so full. And they give you the synopsis of the story that, ha that happened to them. And to them, it's the most traumatic, big event that's ever happened in their life, right? 
to me, unfortunately, I've heard that story and been there so many thousands of times. It's, you don't mean to say it's just another story. They're all unique and terrible in their own way, but I've heard it a million times. And every time, hey, can I talk to the side or hey, and you can see the fidgeting and the uncomfortableness, they're dying to say something. So you find a way to shuffle off to the side or prompt them so they can give themselves permission to what they really want to tell you, right? They want to unburden somebody who seems like they know what they're talking about. And 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 before they even start, I already know what they're going to tell me. You can already tell, right? And you can already see it. Others may not be able to read it because they're trying to chameleonize it, keep it to where others can't see it. But you hear that you hear the horrific story. And that was the that was the beginning of this whole thing in the first place. Hey, I'm tired of I'm tired of putting people in body bags, right? I'm tired of showing up at your bad day. I'm tired of taking your report and having to go sit in court and make sure this dude or dudette or these dirt bags go to prison and might not for the evil they committed. Man, if you could save yourself. I wouldn't have to hear your story and you wouldn't have to give it in the first place. And boy, I tell you, I've seen that for years now. I tell you 20, 25, 30%. Sometimes some classes I've had classes where it's 65%. You quickly realize there's 60 something percent of this crowd. They're sitting here. Four or five of these women have been through a rape or one of the guys has been through a rape. Two or three of these have been through an assault. That lady's sitting over there because her husband died because he took a bullet to the chest and some type of terrible violent event. And it just breaks your heart. The beauty is, the beauty is, these people decided to get back on the horse. As traumatic and as hard as it was for them, they decided emotionally, mentally, I am my own defender. I've got to learn to do it. This dude over here seems like maybe he knows what he's talking about. Maybe he can help me a little bit, or at least I'm going to try. And they come in and they fight through the mental, emotional anguish that they've got. And they beat it. They beat that demon. And they walk away every time. They're stronger. They're more whole. Oftentimes, you get the letters, the emails, how they. I can see that touches you. Is well, it the? They 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 live a better life. They're happier. That's the part. Yeah. yeah. I mean, help them move through pain and find a better way. That's where I, the emotion I look at, comes it, from. Yeah, I see that. Like victims, that if they. If they don't do something, then they're just going to live. Well, maybe I'll be a victim again. Well, well, and, and Dan, you're exactly right, right? I mean, what do our victims do? They either heal or they stay in the cycle of the mental, emotional anguish right. there. And oftentimes they drown their sorrows in a bottle or a needle or in too much credit or too many video games or ignoring those who need them or 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 becoming far too jovial for their nature to try to get through, or they find some crutch to deal with this, right? Or they go down a route that they didn't need to. And now they're robbed of the joy and the, the life that they needed to have, that they should have simply because they're not dealing with it well. Yet dealing with it well, or even dealing with it at all, takes deep courage, right? It takes a lot of internal intestinal fortitude. And unfortunately, that's a hard thing to do, right? It's the same reason why we see our veterans, you know, suck starting their gun somewhere or we see our cops right my, my best friend you can see his thing up there right you know he couldn't deal with the violence that he had and he took his own life so if you can if you can learn to do that you can live or if you're willing to face that and these people are the ones that come they're willing to face that they regain somewhat if not their complete joy they begin, and I get the emails, I get the letters, how, hey, that's that we did this training a year ago and it completely changed my life. And it was so simple. It's only one day or two days or three days or whatever it is. But you know what? I'm sleeping better. Our family life is better. I have a relationship again. You know, I re I re got re brought back in that marriage. I I this, I that. Hey, I became a better employee at work because really it's not about building shooters. It's about building better people. We're just using the gun as the tool, right? Or the training as the tool to build better people. And so therefore, by helping them deal with this, in many ways, it's almost like marital therapy. It's it's almost like mental therapy. It, it's, it's in so many different ways. And now you have people who live far better, fuller lives simply because they had the courage and the guts to move beyond the trauma they lived through and to build the skill that gives them the confidence they can at least try to defend their life the next time. And it's so beautiful to watch them build that never me again, never me again. Yeah, and man, yeah. when you get those people, they're the toughest, roughest people out there. I'd take that grandma good cookies up against a SWAT cop any day of the week because 
they've built it on a mental level and they're solid because they're there for yeah. the right reasons. If we could just get them before that point, that'd be even better. Right. And, you know, we've interviewed several people that have been victims and uh, the, most of the ones that we, well, all of the ones that we interviewed got tr decided they weren't going to be a victim anymore, got their training, super confident people. But then I've also met people, not interviewed, but met people that were a victim and they stayed a victim. You, you know, they're locked themselves in the house. They don't go anywhere. And they, I guess you could say they gave up. They give up. And well, so it's, it's good to see there are people out there to help people learn to give themselves confidence and to live a normal life. Yeah. And, and, and isn't that the, the, the worst part of the crime itself, the crime, whatever it is, right. The rape, the something that's horrific and terrible. I'd say equal, if not worse is the robbing of the, of the, the life they should have had in the aftermath right? or, or, them not having the eternal mental fortitude to go regain the life they deserve. Right. Yeah. And so that's in part on the bad guy, but it's also in part on the victim themselves. They've got to rebuild that, right? We've got to build in our children today, the, the fortitude that, okay, if I get knocked off the horse, it could be the rape. It could be my family members murdered. It was, I got mugged. It could be this or that. I've still got to have the mental fortitude to move beyond and past that and learn to be able to dismiss that in the past, yet prepare for it to never happen again in the future. And, and when we do that, I mean, suddenly people regain what you're talking about, right? They regain the ability to be the whole human they were before they allowed or after they allowed themselves maybe to waller in the victimness mm -hmm. that they, they unfortunately became. Mm -hmm. And if, boy, if, if, if we could just get people on a mental level to build that in our kids from the beginning, we bounce back far better. In fact, I tell you more often than not, you find more joy in the aftermath because you realize how precious it is. Yeah. 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 And, and I think I, I stepped on my own question to you, but so the, the emotion that thank you so much for sharing that with us uh, because we can see how visceral and how real that emotion is. Uh, it's not the stories themselves. I don't think that's causing the emotion. It's the transformation that you help. Yes. Yeah produce yeah yeah That's so I, it, it, at least it is in them when you watch that transformation right when you see that lady who's been through something terrible for that kid right they grew up just abused horrifically you see them heal that you see them transform i mean isn't that the wildest success story in the world for them and is that not the point of this show is that not the point of what people like me do and and man what a what a cool thing to watch somebody regrow or grow into the person they never knew they could be. Right. And, and what, what a true success. And it's all just because they decided to go sit, stand on some dumb gun range with some gun trainer and pull a gun trigger a couple of times and, and then build this and they become the heroes. They truly are. That is beautiful. And it is such an honor when you get to be a part of that in someone else's life. And um, it's uh, that doesn't happen with just some gun trainer. Uh, I know you're being very humble. Uh, it happens when when the trainer really has that level of excellence, right? That heart set that you're not here just to help people le learn how to do sights and triggers. You're here to help with a transformation to build defenders. It's I mean, that doesn't happen just anywhere. So thank you for the work you put in. Well, uh, when you see these people come out like the butterfly, I mean, it's it's a beautiful moment to see, right? It's it's an honor to stand there and watch them struggle and fight and the angst they have and then slowly but surely overcome it and then grow. And I'll tell you, I mean, that's it almost makes you realize how cool it is for the preacher when somebody got saved or whatever it is, right? You're like, wow, okay, we're slightly getting in that arena, right? Or the, the financial expert who helped these people finally get to retirement and do so well. You, you get to see others succeed. And that's just the, that's just, that's the coolest part of it. It yeah. so is. And I can see that you are so, um, you have a heart of a servant. Uh, you're very service uh, minded. Can we yeah. have him on again soon? Absolutely. We're, <laughs> we need to go see him. That's yeah. we no, need. seriously. We, we yeah, need to have you on. You're not, you just confirmed you're not that bright. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I, I, I admit that. But. We're trying to get brighter. Maybe I should have read this, thought this through first, right? No, no but seriously. Brother, you and me are on the same page. I, we I, need, I we need to have you on. Yeah. I'd love to. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much we haven't even touched on yet that I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to help with if I can. Yes, we definitely do have to have you back on. And I know that uh, we're our viewers and our listeners are definitely going to be interested in what more you have to bring. Um, and hopefully it doesn't take us a year to make that happen. Because <laughs> I know your schedule and my schedule are. Uh, it won't, we'll make it happen. I, I think yeah. the last time, the last two times I got sick or COVID, or I don't know, I, something happened or there's no way. And then your schedule is busy. It, that's a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. And synchronizing those calendars sometimes can be, you know, the hardest part. But um, talk to folks as we start wrapping up, how do they follow all that you do? How do they find your podcast? How do they take these amazing classes okay. that we've been talking about? Dive in. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, we have a website. It's defenders-usa.com, right? It's got a hyphen in the middle. So Defenders Dash. Now, a word of caution on that website. It just went live Sunday. We've had we've had some archaic old websites I've hated for over a decade now, and we just recreated this one. Not all of our stuff is on there because I'm literally working on that today. Um, we're, we're, we're working like dogs to get this website done. So it's going to be populated with tons of classes across multiple states and some other things. So website, defenders-usa.com. Um, we also have a YouTube, we actually have two YouTube channels. We have a Defenders USA YouTube channel. And if you're looking for it, you'll just see that shield back there is your the little icon or whatever they call it. So if you look it up, we've got some good stuff there, right? The guy on camera is not that good, but the editing's all right. So you should go look at it. Some of it's educational, some of it's fun, um, but we're trying to grow that. Um, we're just on the edge of monetization. So if you guys would go subscribe we and watch a couple of our videos, whether you like them or not, we'd appreciate it. Um, we also have a YouTube channel called Defenders Live, uh, and you'll see kind of a somewhat same theme there. And it's the podcast. We're going to somehow con both you and Dan, Cheryl, you and Dan on there um, to talk to us. And that's actually hosted by one of our instructors, a phenomenal lady called, uh, named Laura Thorson out of Montana. Uh, she's been with Defenders now about a year, a little over a year now. And she had the guts enough to start up a Defenders Live. And we interview some of the industry experts. And it's not just guns, right? That's what I hate. It's always guns. No, no, no. It, it's, it should be the all the mindset from marriage to finance to you name it. So we have a lot of experts on there. In fact, we have one tomorrow night with Tiffany Johnson. So uh, Cheryl, you'll, you guys will be on there soon. And you're going to have to drag Dan on too. Um, <laughs> But uh, so we have that. That's also got a YouTube channel, but you can find it through ours, too. Uh, of course, you can find us on Facebook, Defenders USA, Instagram, Rumble, um, a couple different platforms. And we're really working to grow that. Now, we have instructors. Uh, somehow I've conned a couple really amazing people to join Defenders over the years. So our headquarters was in Grand Junction, Colorado. I now live down in Arizona, so I'm training people in the Arizona area. But I'm literally traveling from Dallas to Montana to Florida to Missouri to wherever it's training people. I go where I'm invited. Uh, so training the, training people in different areas. So you can come to my courses in the Arizona area or other places. And then we have instructors in Colorado, uh, Texas, and Montana. And they're phenomenal. They're, they're incredible. I, I, I just got lucky. I just got blessed with these people. So they've got some great courses there. You can find them there. And as soon as we get all populated on our website, you can find it on our website. Well, I've been looking at your website while you were talking, and it is gorgeous. So I think you Thank you. It. A lot of work went into it. A lot of work. So I, I have to give credit to where credit's due. Um, we've been working on a web, two different websites the last couple months that just have not gone well. And finally... If you know the name, Robin Sandoval of A Girl and a Gun, which is or the absolutely. largest, yeah, it's the largest ladies gun organization in the world. So Robin's a, just a dear friend. And Robin heard about our troubles and trials with this website. And she called up and she's like, let me help you. You guys need help. And we do. And that poor girl has worked like a dog on all of her stuff and on this website so it's largely due to Robin's expertise. I had no idea she had that expertise too, but she does. And well, so that was, that was, it's amazing. And we're going to keep building it today. 
Awesome. That's awesome. And good luck with everything. And yes, Robin, I don't know. There's got to be like four or five of her. You know, yeah. she's got to yeah. be yeah. because she is so busy and everything she does, she does do with excellence. She's yes. part of the DC project for a long time. Yes. That is uh, one of my passions as well. And uh, that you are very blessed to have her as your <laughs> friend and website builder. So, <laughs> yeah, we were, we were so blessed. So blessed. Careful with your mouse right there. Careful with my mouse. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> he sees me hovering over the thing that helps me in <laughs> your portion of the show and he's trying to be sure I don't push the wrong thing. All right. Well, thank you for Adam, having me. Thank, oh, thank you, you so honor. much for all that you do. It's absolutely an honor and a blessing for us. And I, we will see you very soon. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye. Wow. All right. You know, it, it's funny, you know, you talked about finance and relationships and all these things are the key to it. But, but, after listening to this, I think the best thing that we could do is people that shoot mm -hmm. need to take people that's never shot before mm -hmm. and get them introduced into this. I really think that that may, you may help your next door neighbor never be a victim just by taking them out shooting for the day. Yeah. I mean, really, I, you could, you could put that phrase that you just said on repeat. Yeah. And your neighbor, I don't think kid, you could overstate it. Right. It's beautiful that the, the work that he's doing and um, I just, uh, I like the idea that he's taking it away really kind of from the tool itself, which is important, right? right? But he's setting the standard right there with his brand name, Defenders, right? Because we all want to protect what we love. We all right. want to defend what we love. Yeah. Right? I think we went over time. We may have a little bit, but uh, it was so worth it. Um, thank you so much to our awesome guest, Adam Winch of Defenders USA. Thank you to all of our listeners all over the planet, wherever yes. there's internet. We have viewers and listeners. Your time is your most finite commodity. And when you spend it with us, that is priceless. That is everything. Right. Thank you so much. And then you don't just like passively tune in. You take these conversations with these subject matter experts that we get to have around your dining room tables, right? Into your carpools, into your spheres of influence. And that is where the needle really right. moves and in your life and others. By sharing this, especially today's episode, you may save somebody from being a victim. I absolutely believe that. So, you know, why would you not want to do that? Absolutely. And so if you, I think I need to say the word absolutely about four more times. Say before. it. <laughs> absolutely. Can I buy a new car? I absolutely need to say Thank you. Word. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Can I buy a new coin? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Moving on. If you want to rewatch this video or any of the videos that we have, please go to our YouTube channel, our gun streamer channel, Apple, Spotify, any place you find your videos. And please, as Adam said, subscribe and hit the notifications button because that not only keeps you on top of what's going on here, it also tells those platforms that you value this information. Right. And it gives us a little hedge against getting canceled. Um, if you want to listen to the audio only version, go to our website, gunfreedomradio.com. Click the on demand tab and binge listen to your heart's content, darling. Beautifully said. If you want to learn more about each one of our guests, uh, like Adam and the links to their pages and their, their books they might have written or any of the other works they have, click our guest tab and there is a huge resource there of subject matter experts and uh, when you spend time there we don't hate that no all right until next time we are going to pray for this nation pray for our leaders yes all, all of them dan yes even the ones you don't like i haven't heard from the ones i don't like too often they've been quiet lately yeah but do you so i like them more oh yeah pray that they shut up Maybe I mean, I'm, uh, yeah I'll, did i say that <laughs> out loud i didn't say that out loud for the ones who yeah. you are frustrated with and don't like right all right until next time be good to each other have a great week and god bless bye-bye